All right, we have our next presenter, Maggie Zay. She will be presenting on her thesis of Egypt tourism in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, characterizing alternatives to mass tourism. For her thesis advisor is Sarah Sorsa, and her thesis is in her French. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for making it out to our thesis symposium today. I'm really excited to share what I've been working on over this school year, school year with you. Um, and yeah, thank you so much to my advisor, Sarah. It's been great working with you this year. Uh, as Jason said, the title of my study is Ecotourism in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, Characterizing an Alternative to Mass Tourism. So before I begin to provide some context behind the idea for this project, uh, I'm from Colorado and therefore intimately familiar with the Rocky Mountains and all of the recreational opportunities that they provide. And when I'm home, I take every chance that I can to hike, ski, backpack, rock climb, uh, do all of what other, whatever activity is in season at the time. And uh, millions of people join me every year in engaging with the mountains in this way of recreation. Um, and I wanted to take this opportunity to investigate uh, the implications of these activities on a more systemic level. Um, <laughs> So the tourism industry in Colorado is very important to the economy, identity, um, and overall culture. So as I said before, some of the activities that are included in this are skiing, hiking, whitewater rafting, hunting, but uh, also many more. And because of this wide range of activities that are available year round, um, it makes it very versatile in terms of recreation and therefore it appeals to a wide audience. Um, there's not really one typical a demographic for people that uh, visit Colorado and engage with the Rocky Mountains um, because it is able to appeal to so many different types of people. And this leads uh, Colorado's economy to being very dependent on the tourism industry. In the year 2021, uh, it had $21.9 billion in travel spending with 82.4 million visitors in just one year. And there's, it's also important to note the communities that this happens in. Mountain towns have very small uh, year-round populations relative to the uh, numbers of visitors that they host every year. But these residents engage with the mountains in similar ways. They're popular for a reason. They enjoy similar hobbies. Um, and it, these activities and scenery are very important to a strong identity with uh, outdoor recreation in these communities. So the current form of tourism that we see in Colorado can be identified as mass tourism. And what this looks like is uh, large crowds, at times tens of thousands of individuals visiting a popular destination, often on a seasonal basis for recreation and entertainment purposes. But as I mentioned before, since Colorado has uh, activities that are possible in the Rocky Mountains year round, um, it's really not seasonal because especially in the summer and winter, we see very large amounts of people consistently. Um, and then this leads to economic dependency on the tourism industry, as I mentioned before, despite damages that it can cause in other, uh, through other setting, or other realms. Um, and for example, uh, this can cause environmental damage as overcrowding pushes people off of designated recreation areas into more sensitive ecosystems, which can damage uh, local flora and fauna. And then additionally, this puts pressure on the natural environment and resources um, in these small communities that are already very sensitive and have limited resources, such as water and land. Um, and then this can all accumulate into negative community sentiments toward visitors uh, from the year-round residents. Um, which can cause negative relationships between the communities and their visitors. So ecotourism is an alternative and potential solution to mass tourism. Um, and it has three principles, which are nature, sustainability, and education. But beyond these principles, there's a lack of a universal definition. Um, at best, it can support local economies while encouraging conservation and fostering positive relationships between communities and their visitors and the companies that operate in them. But when it's not executed intentionally, then it can cause further damage to environments and uh, tarnish the relationships between communities and their visitors. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this, these different interpretations of ecotourism using these three principles can create misunderstandings and also variable outcomes, which can harm the relationships further. 
So this leads me to my research question, which is what are the defining characteristics of the outdoor tourism industry in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado? And I'm used the three lenses or the three principles of nature, education, and sustainability to analyze this question. And then I wanted to see if ecotourism can have a positive impact in this region, depending on how it is interpreted and executed. And then for this, why did I choose this location specifically? Um, currently, literature on ecotourism is very focused in tropical and developing areas with that also have large outdoor tourism industries. Um, but this is often due to their luxury beach resort vacations. But I wanted to see what this could look like in my home state of Colorado because we also have a very large outdoor tourism industry. Um, but it definitely looks different. But it seems that ecotourism could be relevant and applied uh, similarly here but it is definitely underrepresented in literature and practice. So in order to actually conduct this study, I uh, collected data starting with 93 companies that I found on the Colorado Tourism Office Office's website. And I created a database for all of the companies where I tested for the presence of ecotourism's three principles of nature, sustainability, and education. And I uh, identified these based on different qualifying factors for each principle. For example, education was marked as being yes if the company offers guided services, technical instruction, or lessons on other topics such as local history, ecology, or culture. And then after this, I sent out a survey to all of the companies that were included in the database uh, and asked a representative to fill them out. To fill out. And this survey collected information on the company's what understandings and interpretations of ecotourism. And some of them hadn't even heard of the word before. Um, and then, so this provided data or insight into how they uh, interpret it and then also how they do or do not practice it and their perceptions. And then finally, three follow-up interviews were conducted with uh, representatives that filled out the survey to continue the conversation and provide more context into how um, they actually interpret uh, ecotourism as well as how they uh, do or don't implement it <laughs> and perceive the issues of mass tourism right now. And then the outputs for this was creating two frameworks for sustainability and education. Uh, and each framework consisted of a model that, uh, four models that were ranked, one being uh, no representation of that principle, four being the strongest representation. And this will be visualized shortly. So for the sustainability framework, these were the four models. Uh, so one, no mention. Uh, that means that environmentalism was not referenced on the company's websites. Two, acknowledgement environmentalism was referenced, but not really any tangible evidence for how it's exercised. So for example, saying that they care about the environment, but not really anything beyond what that looks like. Model three, action. Um, this means that the company demonstrated an understanding of sustainability and having specific initiatives in place, um, but it was largely on the part, the duty of the staff members and not really involving clients. So finally, model four, integration, um, is another step up uh, involving clients in land stewardship and the sustainable practices of the company as part of the service. And this can influence future behavior to have a positive impact beyond just the present activity. Moving on to education, similarly with model one, um, it's really not present uh, based off of the company's websites. So it's called unintentional um, and learning is not really the primary goal. And this is often because there's little interactions between staff and clients. Um, model two is exposure. Um, and this is education mainly just in the way that comes with people trying any kind of new activity um, or being in a new place. But again, education is not um, one of the main intended goals of the service. Um, and then model three, technical. This focuses on technical skills necessary for uh, participating in some type of outdoor hobby. And um, it can provide an in-depth education on one specific activity. For example, teaching uh, tech, the techniques necessary for rock climbing. Um, and then model four, holistic. It can include uh, the aspects of model three but it has a more holistic integration on, so it has educational aspects on multiple different topics relevant to the place that they're in as, and the activity. So this can include um, technical skills, but also focuses on local ecology, history, culture, and things like that. 
Uh, so then also just to visualize uh, the results for these. So each company in the database was assigned frameworks for um, both sustainability and education. And this shows how they line up. So on the x-axis, we have the sustainability frameworks one, two, three, and four, and then uh, similar for uh, education on the y-axis. And so you can see that sustainability framework one was the most common um, for that. And then education framework two was most common. And the uh, most common unique combination for the two was uh, sustainability framework one and education two. Um, so you can also see that there is generally a higher representation at the lower models for each framework. But one notable um, exemption from this is the eight companies that were at sustainability, the highest models for each framework of education and sustainability, um, which is interesting to know and supports the idea that education and sustainability were, were more interconnected at those higher models. So these are quotes from the interviews that were conducted. Um, and as you can see, the companies had different combinations of frameworks for education and sustainability. And it leads to different interpretations that we can see. For example, company A expressed frustration in the effectiveness of their education and then trying to leverage a more unique approach of uh, harnessing clients', clients experiences um, with the mountains to motivate them to act more mindfully of the environment. And then company B, um, we can see that they believe that the environment is crucial to their service, which is natural for companies operating in the tourism industry in the Rockies. Um, but they are also aware that uh, with prolonged environmental damage, they cannot persist and they wanna be mindful of their role in this issue. And then finally, company C expressed um, concern with mass tourism, uh, pre preventing their ability to engage more on an ecotourism level, largely due to overcrowding, um, which can prevent people from having a more immersive and holistic experience in the places that they are. So some implications from uh, my findings is that staff members had a very unique position in these uh, services. They act as mentors for clients, not just in the activities or showing them new places, but also on a, on a higher level, especially in land stewardship. And the staff members also have a unique role as because they are long-term residents of the, the communities that it's happening in, but they're also part of the tourism industry because, because they work in it. So they can also act as ambassadors to bridge the gap between community members and the companies. And then accessibility is also another very important factor for ecotourism here, uh, because in order to overcome the obstacles that tourism per, uh, currently poses to the Rocky Mountains, uh, the message needs to be spread to diverse groups because so many different types of people engage with the mountains and then finally, place-based concepts must also uh, guide the design and services because uh, it has to contextualize the economic, social, and ecological impacts of the service. And there's not really one uh, blanket way to do that. It has to be uh, more personalized to the location. So back to that second question, can ecotourism have a positive impact in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado? Um, it definitely has the potential to these outdoor based tourism services um, and it has to leverage the unique roles of staff members being accessible and informed by place based concepts and combine that in conjunction with the ecotourism ecotourism's three principles of nature education and sustainability and when these are appropriately um, integrated with each other, then the natural environment can be protected and while responsible stewardship is taught to all clients so it can have a more positive like ripple effect in uh, their lives moving on. And then it can also foster a more positive relationship between the companies, communities, and clients that engage with ecotourism. So that, thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you. It's really interesting that people who are in the mountain area, we hear because they obviously love to build and stuff. They're intentionally around sustainability. 
Yeah, so it was actually surprising because a lot of those organizations, there wasn't one main like unifying factor, but a few of them were more uh, specific like institutes. So more like there was one that was connected to a university, but focused on engaging visitors with the land around them. But others were normal companies, uh, different types of like outfitters or companies that uh, could be found in all of the models. Like there was a whitewater rafting company and there were whitewater rafting companies in all models. So it was kind of interesting how a similar service could be very different. Yeah, that, I think that was a very common sentiment among the companies that were surveyed and interviewed as well, um, because a big, and even as you were saying this, so kind of surprising that so many people were not uh, being more conscious of sustainability. Um, it was pretty common that uh, maybe they would like to be more sustainable, but just inherently by having such large crowds, it's very hard to act mindfully in that way because just by like existing, um, it puts strain on the environment and resources. So a lot of the companies uh, were expressing concern with maybe their models are sustainable, but how can they scale it up to serve the 82 million visitors that Colorado has every year? So that is another issue that uh, future research could definitely investigate. Well, it's also kind of a question about more methods used. So I'm wondering if you have any concerns about how is um, the trader going to be branding or whether that branding is reflective uh, of mm -hmm. your your idea of different. Yeah, that was definitely a limitation to this study because um especially like in assigning the frameworks, uh, it could be made just based off of their websites when in reality, their operations uh, might contrast from that identity. Um, and so I think that it would be interesting in the future to conduct a study that is more based on uh, like more interviews and surveys to see how their operations match up with that. Because even in the survey and interviews that I did, uh, I definitely found inconsistencies. For example, with like, model one for sustainability not mentioning it on their website is that because they actually don't understand sustainability or act mindfully of it or they could act mindfully of sustainability in their operations but it's not presented on their website so there's no real way of knowing yes. mentioning what the customers want mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was interesting. So part of the survey uh, was like ranking questions. And one of the questions was a statement about the company cares about sustainability, ranked one through five, five being the most. And then um, it asked the same question, but the company's clients cares about care about sustainability. And that was um, one of the biggest discrepancies in the survey results. Companies always ranked their uh, them caring about sustainability much higher than their clients. At times, they gave themselves a five and their clients a one. And uh, like one of, the, <laughs> one of the companies I interviewed talked about uh, like their clients are flying in on private jets because they're in Aspen, Colorado. Um, but their main idea was like when they're out there with them, they're in the mountains, they're enjoying, like at that moment, they're not using any resources um, and so just kind of trying to harness that more like in the moment, like awe kind of, and uh, using that as motivation to hopefully make some kind of future impact, but definitely a big discrepancy in that perception. Do you know, the companies for like maybe their, their business model is for, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. how much can you really, yeah so I think with that um 
a big a common issue that they also discussed was at what point kind of like with scopes of emissions at what point do they consider it their environmental impact versus like their customers or like the overall tourism industries um and i a very common idea was like they can't really start there because the people are people are going to be visiting the mountains no matter what and so it's they see that like the most effective place that they can do is trying to change what people are doing while they're there and then i think that would be more of like a systemic issue to resolve. Um, that's hard for any one specific company to change the amount of people that visit an entire state. Thank you. Thank you.